scientific term, it's just an observational term, it depends on where it's growing. If it's in your bathroom, it's a mold. If it's on the leaf of a plant, it's a rust, smut, or mildew. So if we say when we walk into a basement it smells like mildew, that's incorrect. But, but that's okay, that's your standard of care. And this starts saying smut. Yeah, you're not. Yeah, I smell smut. <laughs> that'll that'll get a couple of eyebrows. Yeah, just like it's just like if you walked into a house and you said, "I smell coffee." Are you saying that there's coffee there? No, you smell coffee. It smells like baked bread. Okay, it smells like mold. Uh, that's perfectly legitimate. Uh, kind of smells moldy down here in this basement. Okay, you don't know it's it's actually geosmins and what's called MIB, big long chemical name. Has nothing to do with mold, but it smells moldy. All right, or worse again, um, we use odors to determine if the house has dry rot. That has a very moldy odor, and oh my gosh, I can walk into a building and just by smelling the air, I can tell you if the house has dry rot somewhere in it because it's so characteristic. So these are valuable observations, and you are correct. Everyone is correct. So more commonly, though, you see what we see in real estate is that buyers see signs of past water, period. Mm -hmm. That's what generally triggers, in my experience, that a buyer is, oh my god, water equals mold. Yep. And so what you're saying is, you can say with confidence that unless you see mold, unless you smell mold, the mere fact of seeing water does not warrant Correct. If you walk into a structure that's had catastrophic water failure, you walk uh, catastrophic water loss or a leak, and you see you see water damage on the wall, and you say, "Oh man, uh, there's eight feet of water damage. It looks like the roof was leaking, and it's all stained, and I can see it." Um, and so then somebody says, "Well, maybe we need to have a mold test." You can look at them and go, "No need to. I can look at it and tell you doesn't have a mold problem." Then, then the next thing they're going to say is, but what, if, what if it's in the wall cavity? All right? then, you, then you say, mold is a problem if and only if. A, it is an aesthetic problem. Okay, it's ugly. B, it has compromised the structural integrity of the surface. Or C, it's an exposure issue. You look at that wall and you go, it's ugly, so we're going to paint it. All right, that's how we're going to take care of the aesthetic problem. B, mold does not compromise structural integrity of anything. It grows only on the surface. So that can't be a problem. And then C, if it's in the wall cavity, how are you going to get exposed to it? You're not. Therefore, what are you going to correct if there is no problem other than painting over that surface? Mold will always come back unless you correct the moisture problem. Which is why US EPA, for example, says do not apply biocides or fungicides or any sterilants because it's useless. Because if you don't correct the moisture problem, it doesn't matter what you put on that wall, that mold's going to come back. And in many cases, it's going to use that fungicide to, uh, to its advantage. The house that you showed in Arvada, the, you had pictures of the house. That oh, yeah, 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 okay. So, to mold remediate that, it would involve what? Oh, for, for that house, what they did was they went in, they removed the drywall, drywall. And, and then they went and they excavated a trench along the building, and they laid a French drain in there to divert the groundwater from the foundation wall. And so that would be an appropriate remediation, but unfortunately, so commonly, I think the consumer and real estate agents interpret mold remediation to be spray fungicide down and uh, maybe replace the drywall, maybe paint over the drywall and call that mold remediation. Is that what you call um, Very typically what we see is where um, a mold remediator will come in and they'll say it's going to cost you 20000 Perfect example, Conifer, Colorado, a couple of days ago, it was between, uh, the bid was between $20,000 and $40,000 to remediate the mold. Turns out, that, so they called me in, all right, cost them 500 bucks. Turns out that, um, that the house did not have a mold problem. There were only two small colonies of mold, one of Cladosporium, one of Stachybotrys. Both of them were on those building materials when the house was built in the 60s. 
They were actually put in there with the mold already on them. What the house had was a dry rot problem, which the contractor had already adequately taken care of because he had stripped out the outside uh, shell on the east side of the building and exposed all that wood. He realized it was dry rot, so he'd sistered some of the, the studs and the beams and everything, and he removed the ones that were really badly damaged, and he was done. And so we went in, we said, yes, this is appropriate, you're done. You did mold remediation. Okay, um, and uh, there was a, um, a, f a military facility, and I've got a photograph of it here if we have time. There was a military facility in, in New Jersey. They were looking at a five million dollar mold remediation project in 23 buildings, 19 buildings, anyway, numerous buildings. And, um, and this, there was, I mean, <laughs> we see one of the photographs. Hundreds of thousands of square feet of mural mold growing on the walls. And the contractors that were bidding on it said, we have to remove all the drywall, we have to go into moon suits, we have to do testing, we have to go respirators, and then we have to put all that material back. They were looking at $5 million. They called me out there. I went out there and I said, here's what you need. Go down to Lowe's, get a shop vac, get two guys and a bristle brush, and literally take that shop vac and vacuum the mold, and it's very easy, vacuum the mold, off of those surfaces and you're done. And it was that easy. And the total cost because of the employees wages and the shop and the shop back was like uh, $17,000 or something. So that, why that, did they sell you on your insurance policy uh, a mold addendum and it's so expensive? Because they were going to have to that has to do with actuaries and liability and our crazy court system not science, which is why I get called in then to, to bring the science to bear on, on, these, on some of these questions. And so, and I'm so sorry to keep interrupting you. Oh no. It's such a great, uh, we deal with this. We have a constant we have a case right now where fires are getting ready to close and now they claim that plumber told them they're going to have $10,000 for the remediation. Um, so our agents could call your organization and you could come and say, yeah, there's not a mold problem here, for instance our seller here. This would be a good example of why our agents might want to recommend that a seller contract with you. Is that correct? Yes. And it's going to be more likely that a seller is going to call you, not a buyer, to prove that it's not a problem. It would be more common. Chris, where are we going right after this talk? <laughs> uh, after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> to do a mold job. For a realtor, yeah, for because a realtor. Um, they're trying to sell, we don't even know if it's an, it's, it must be an apartment because it's a unit number, so it must be an apartment or a condo or something. And what happened was is a home inspector went in and a home inspector said, oh, you have a mold problem, but that's okay. My buddy has a mold remediation company and they were looking at, at $15,000 remediation. All right, now we're going to go out there and we're going to evaluate the situation. Um, we were told that the mold is in a cupboard. So right away it tells me that it's probably not a catastrophic water loss situation. It may not even be mold. I'm going to show you some photographs of some cases we've been involved in where certified mold inspectors have said this is mold and you need to evacuate the facility. And it wasn't even mold. All right. So, so um, oftentimes what will happen, and, and I was involved in a huge lawsuit. I testified in federal court. Uh, it was $5.5 million. There were 56 housing units. And there, on, opposing me was a certified mold inspector with the Colorado Association of Meth and Mold Professionals, who, by the way, a board of the directors, happens to be also, in, in violation of state statutes, a regulator in the state of Colorado. All right. Conflict of interest. But in any event... So they said, he came in and said, oh, you need to evacuate these buildings. You need to do this, that. And I said, I said, here's what you need to do. You need to correct the water problem, number one. Number two is you need to go and wipe off wherever there's mold, evaluate the drywall. If the drywall's in good shape, you're good to go. If the drywall is damaged, replace the drywall. And they said, what about all the mold that's in the wall cavities? And I said, leave it there. And they were stunned and shocked. And they were going, are you seriously saying to leave mold in the structure? I said, yeah, yeah. So during the deposition, they, this, this attorney just tried to tear me up over this. And so, and so I challenged him. And I said, tell you what we'll do. I said, right here in this deposition, go get me a, a, a knife, a drywall knife. I said, I'm gonna cut into your walls right here in this room. I said, and I'll concede your point if I don't find mold inside that wall cavity. And they wouldn't let me do it. Because they knew 
If I get into that wall, I'm going to find mold in that attorney's office. And the, the World Health Organization, amongst others, says leaving mold inside a wall cavity is perfectly acceptable. Because, you, number one, you can't be exposed to it and you can't see it. So who cares if it's there? Besides that, it's always there. Always, 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 anyway, whether you can see it or not, usually you can't, sometimes you can. So it's there. We know it's there. All right? Um, so so w w mold is in every wall cavity. Number one. Number two is dozens of studies have been performed that show that it's of absolutely no consequence whatsoever. So leaving mold inside wall cavities is not an issue. So if somebody were to say to me on that wall, that wall over there, yes, boy, that's terrible. That's, uh, you know, that's, that's water damage. And the bottom part of it is really in bad shape. Let's just cut that out and put a new piece of drywall, but the rest of it is kind of okay. Let's just paint over it. And somebody says, well, what about if there is mold in the wall cavity? I'll go, that's not an if question. There is mold in the wall cavity, and we're going to leave it there because it's inconsequential. Because there's mold in every wall cavity. Why are you going to concern yourself about that one? Catastrophic water loss. People say, oh gosh, uh, I went away on Friday, I left the house, the, wa the water line broke, and I came back on Monday morning and I found my house was completely destroyed by flooding. Do I have a mold problem? Even under ideal conditions, it's not going to grow in three days. It's just not going to grow. Okay. Um, it, it, it is very slow growing stuff, number one. All right. And so you get back on Monday and now you begin your drying out process, you're not going to have a mold problem, almost certainly. All right. And if you have no idea how much you're changing your life. <laughs> <laughs> the clothing that have been derailed that everyone's going to die and close on this house because last night there was a flooding in the basement. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've, I've heard of, Oh, here. Uh, by the way, I'm wrapping this up. So here's the uh, here's a, a photograph of the um, uh, in uh, Picatinny, New Jersey where they call me out. This, remember, remember when we talked about um, ghosting, when we are talking about meth, and we talked about thermophoretic deposition? Moisture also follows thermophoretic deposition. So these are what all 23 or 19 buildings looked like. We had drywall. These buildings had been built, and then they had a change of uh, budgeting or something. I can't remember what had happened. But so now these buildings that had been built were left abandoned for almost two years in New Jersey. And, of course, moisture accumulated. So what happened was is we have, it speaks to us, we have these we have even distribution of mold growth on these walls and on the ceiling and notice how you can even see where the, the studs are behind there. The reason you can see those studs is because the, um, as the water tries to condense, it's going to condense on that which is the coldest. Well, the wall studs retain sufficient heat to stop that condensation from occurring, and so the condensation occurs on the drywall in between the studs. All right? This was literally hundreds and thousands of square feet of confluent, this is called mural mold, a, a mural mold. And, um, and so <clears throat> we, what we said was, uh, literally, I walked up, I, I was going to bring videos, and Chrissy said, we don't have enough time. Uh, and I just, I walked up and I said, okay, guys, let me show you something. And I went, <laughs> I took my hand, and just by brushing this stuff off, I just brushed it off with my hand. And I said, there's your mold remediation. Okay, that I just remediated like four square feet in two seconds, <laughs> right? And so what they did was they went and they just got a shop vac with a bristle brush and they literally just vacuumed the walls and they vacuumed the ceiling and then they, once they got heat back into those buildings, it, it took care of the condensation problem. So, so again, the mold is telling us a story and in this particular case, the story it's telling us, it's telling us why that mold is there, condensation, because we have even distribution, nice even distribution, no water leaks. Mold is going to follow water leaks, all right? You're going to have a demarcation of, of colonization. Something like this, it tells us, it's screaming to us why it's there. It's there because there was no heat in the building and we had condensation. In this particular structure, again, what I see here is on this door, I see even distribution of mold on this door. It's condensation. What you, uh, down here, we've got uh, mold patches 
on the carpet. Uh, this carpet is so wet that it sloshes as, I, as I'm walking through there. Right? We use this house um, as a scientific investigation. So all the sampling we did in here wasn't because we wanted to find out did it have a mole problem. We, we were really just developing data uh, as we went through. I'm gonna, move, I'm gonna move this door, I'm gonna pull this door, I'm gonna close it, I'm gonna look behind there on the stairs. And then we see this, okay. <laughs> this is called Pazizia domicilia. Pazizia, yeah, dog poop, yeah, yeah. It's anything in Latin, right, yeah. Uh, and what this actually is, is uh, this is also known as the common indoor mushroom. We've seen this growing in many houses. We've even seen it growing in, in cars, all right? Uh, this is very common in Colorado. Uh, usually we see it in crawl spaces or we'll see it where water is coming up through the carpet. And, um, and these things can grow, oh, probably to about a diameter of like this. Uh, they can be tiny, tiny little guys or they can be great big guys. Um, they're not poisonous. In fact, you could eat them. <laughs> they don't look very appetizing, but um, you, could, you could actually eat them. They are not poisonous. Um, and so uh, this is something we're looking for. That's known as a uh, fruiting body. The Pazizia demosilia that I just showed you, that's the fruiting body. That's the visible part of the mold. Here's another example of a fruiting body. This is a wood rot. I'm on my back. I'm looking up, you can see the OSB, I'm in a crawl space, there's the OSB, and this is a floor joist. So I'm on my back and I'm taking a photograph. This is the fruiting body of a wood rot, okay? These are fungi, but they're not molds. It's not filamentous, okay? It's a fruiting body. You see something like this, you don't want to be calling a mold expert, you want to be calling a structural engineer to come in and, and see what, what could be going on with this structure. This is a house in Evergreen. Um, this is the fruiting body. All the drywall was in place when I got there and they called me out and they said, oh my gosh, what is this thing? And I said, this thing is called a fruiting body. It's an organism. It's the visible side of probably a hidden mold. I said, if we remove the drywall from the ceiling, we're probably gonna see that you have structural damage. And we did, and we pulled the drywall down and sure enough, this is the damage that's done to the uh, structural timbers. So again, the fruiting bodies are telling us that there's something else going on. This, this is in Highlands Ranch. Wait till you hear this story, right? I get a phone call and this guy tells me, he says, he said, I, I got up last night, he said, about two o'clock in the morning and I went to the bathroom, he said, and as I was walking through my living room, I saw a glow, a greenish glow coming out from under my sofa. And he said, he said to me, he says, I need you to come out and check this out for me. Well, now you guys know that I deal in methamphetamine, right? So like a conversation like that's really common with me, but it's not usually due to mold, right? And so I said, oh, you, you got a glow in the dark something in your house. He said, yeah, he says, really weird. And of course I thought he was crazy. And I got out to this beautiful house, very, very nice house. And, and he said, he said, I was terrified to, to look under the couch. He said, cause you know, there's this, this green light coming out. He said, he said, so I just went back to bed and he, he said, I decided I'll, I'll check it out in the morning. Okay. One way or another. And so anyway, he moved the couch. He's pulled the couch out and this is what was behind the couch. And you can see the spore field back here. These are spores. And this is a glow in the dark mushroom. And these spores are glow in the dark as well. We still don't know what this organism is. This is one of the organisms that I submitted uh, to um, botanical gardens and then it's gone around the world. They're trying to key it and they still haven't done it. They haven't keyed it out yet. Um, but um, I, threw a, I threw a tennis ball in there just to give you an idea of the, the size. When I went to harvest this fruiting body, um, it was with all my strength. These, this is like leather. Not only did I pull the carpet up, I pulled the mop board away from the wall. It was, it was attached to everything. It looks fragile and, and sort of all frilly. Man, it, it, is like, it was like old shoe leather. It, it, it was the consistency. Um, uh, so again, we get into names. Does it matter what the name is? No, it turns out this water was leaking. There was a, what's called a brain coral on the other side, a different organism on the other side. And this told us that we have serious water problem from that alone, because I'm on the second floor. I could, I could just tell the guy, we have some flashing problems going on with the window, almost certainly. And that's exactly what we found out, was when they went in, it was a construction defect, and we found out that the water was leaking. Again, it tells us a story. Um, it, we know that there's a water problem. We really don't have to do any sampling. What story does this tell us? My technician is here. He's, he's on his back. We're in a crawl space. 
and I'm looking up and I'm taking a photograph of the floor, uh, the flooring above me in, in the crawl space. What do, you th what do you see in this photograph? I definitely see a line of demarcation. A line of demarcation, a very clear line of demarcation. I have two boards in the same environment, exact same environment. One is mold free, one's tons of mold. What do you think that tells us? Well, what was that? Maybe one was treated and one wasn't? What this tells us is that, and this was part of a, in, in uh, Jackson, Wyoming, this was part of a huge mold. They actually had done two whole buildings at 20,000 each, and they had like 15 more buildings to do before we got there. We said, stop. What we found out was that these were put in to the structure with the mold already on them. Drive, drive down around through the Denver metropolitan area. Take a look at the houses that are being built. Do you have these big wooden structures? They're completely exposed to the rain, the snow, the sleet, the sun. The, the water content in those buildings is huge. And why, why is nobody running around complaining about mold growth? Well, they go, yeah, there's mold on there. Take a look at the timbers in the driveway that they're going to be using to put in that structure. They've been sitting there for months. They've been in the lumber yard for months. You think mold's going to grow on them? Of course it is. That's why the US EPA says that it is impossible, not only is it impossible to eliminate mold from the living structure, virtually every house has mold growth in it anyway. You just don't know where it is. But it's there. It's there. So what we said was, another thing that we had was, we also took a photomicrographs of these joints and what we showed was that the mold colonies had been crushed. So we knew that as the, as the wood was put down onto the TJI, it crushed the colony. And our photomicrographs also showed that there was no mycelial mats, there was no mycelia extending from the wood over onto the TJI, which would have indicated growth. What does this picture show us? I'm, I'm in an attic, I'm looking up, I'm taking a photograph. This is the, the roofing material, and these are nails coming through the roofing material. This is um, just one of the slats that they put the plywood down on. What do you think this is telling us? This was a case out of Durango, Colorado, and there was a lawsuit involved with this, and this photograph solved the lawsuit. This, this put an end to it in a heartbeat. It's really interesting that one nail is rusted and one is not rusted. That is a great observation. And actually, that came into play in, in the testimony. Uh, this nail is not rusted. This nail uh, is rusted. This nail was put in um, about, this nail was put in about 15 years after that nail. But that's a different issue. So, a great observation, but ignoring that for a moment, what does this show us? Water. Well, yes, definitely water, because we have mold growth. But it's like, so, like, like minor or like condensation. Yes, it, it is actually condensation. Um, it is a condensation mold growth. What it shows us is that when this nail came through that piece of wood, it disturbed it disturbed the colony. It disturbed the colony and it disturbed the wood and as the nail came through it lifted this piece of wood here and it exposed fresh wood underneath it and there's no mold growing on that newly exposed wood. Therefore we can conclude very confidently that it was there when the nail was driven through. Since we knew when that nail, the date that nail was driven through, because it was the date that the roof was put on, we can say with confidence that that mold was on that board when that nail was driven through, because if the mold grew afterwards, it would be on the exposed wood underneath. The lawsuit involved <laughs> the guy that put these in. And it was, he was accused of doing it wrong, so water got into the attic and caused the mold to grow. And what we said was, nope, wasn't his fault because that mold was already on that wood back in 72 or whenever when the original roof was put in because that nail was put in on the original roof and that disturbed the mold growth at that time. And no mold has grown after that point. So it tells us a story. Mold growth tells us a story. How about this mold growth? This is uh, mold growth in an attic. What do we see here that tells us something strange going on here? This is where a certified mold inspector went in, said, oh, you've got mold in your attic. It's going to cost you thousands of dollars to fix. 
What does it tell us? Okay. There's no mold behind the pipe. And there's mold on the pipe. Mold doesn't grow on pipes, not on metal pipes. Okay. And, but the observation the gentleman made was we have a pipe here, and look, we have a shadow. We have a shadow here. We have a shadow there. We have shadows here. All right. Because this isn't mold. <laughs> this is overspray. And what had happened was, is the, uh, when the structure was built, you've got a construction guy who's saying to himself, I don't want to waste time trimming the walls. Don't put the ceiling in until I painted the walls. So he goes through with his acoustical material, his spray, and he sprays, 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 sprays. The spray paint comes up through. The, there's no ceiling here when he does the spray. It comes up. It hits this surface. This is all overspray. And, and so we went in. Oh, yeah. And he took samples to prove it. Now, now what do you think his sample showed? It had mold. Yeah, it's just stepped the back of caucus. It was loaded with spectacacacacus, right? Why? Why was it loaded with stepped the back of caucus? Because it's everywhere. So no matter where he takes a sample in here, he's going to find it. Every report says that too. But yeah. 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 Oh, that's a party trick. That's a party trick of mine. Somebody will say, oh, I've got a mold report in. And I'll stop and I'll go over the phone. I'll go, let me tell you what it says. And I'll tell them. Like, how did you know? It's like, because that's what they all say. What do you think you're going to find? So this is an example of a mold inspector saying that, there, that it's mold when it isn't. Here's another example. Also a mold inspector said this is all mold. You have to remove the walls. No, it's dissolved salts. That's all. It's, it's water. It's, a, it's water damage. This is a, a property out at, um, by, in the area by DIA Stapleton. These are the new structures. And they had some mold in another part of the building. And I explained to them, I said, this is a north exterior wall and it has not been insulated correctly. And I said, anything that you put up against that north wall, whether it's a filing cabinet or, or anything else like that, if you put it up against the wall, you will be able to grow mold. And, and right happened, there was a closet right there, and I said, and I saw the shelving there, and I said, let me show you. I said, see the shelving that's against this wall? I said, I guarantee you, if I move the shelving back that's laid up against the wall, there's mold behind there. And I pulled it back, and I got lucky. <laughs> There was mold there, right? And it's the stacky bictococcus stuff, right? Yeah, and, and there it is, and it's growing there. And I pulled it back, and I said, there you go. We went out into the office, and I said, filing cabinet? Move the filing cabinet. There's going to be mold behind there. And there was. And it's because the mold tells us a story. It's a north wall. It's a cold wall. And there's no ventilation. You put a filing cabinet up against there, and it's going to there's no ventilation. It's going to trap that moisture, and it's going to allow that mold to grow. It tells us a story. Very hard to see this just a couple of days ago. Uh, we were out doing a, a, a realtor called us in because a, a client said the house is full of mold. And, and so we said, okay, let's get out there and let's take a look. And this is the ghosting that we talked about earlier. And we can see it all through here. And it was all through this structure. And um, we went out and we said, it's not mold, it's cigarette tobacco. It's cigarette smoke and candles that have played it out onto the walls. Um, it is not mold. We actually did find a couple of small places where there was mold, but that was because of a leaking roof. This is more typical of, of what you're going to find. This is a exterior wall in a garage in Thornton, and it tells us a story. We see no mold. We see heavy damage. We see stachybotrys here. We've got penicillium here. Again, we have that gradation of colonization. And so what we, we told them was, so you got a water leak. Go out there, figure out why you got a water leak. Turns out there was a big crack in the, in the brick wall and water was getting into it. It was pooling down at the bottom and coming out. We said, this is an easy fix. This was a real estate transaction. Go in, just cut this whole section out, put it in, retape it, and then paint it, and you're good. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. This is not rocket science. You want to know how to handle mold? Call your grandpa, because he's going to tell you how to handle mold. This gets us into wood rots. If you see something like this, you need a, a, um, uh, an engineer to come out and take a look at it. This is a wood rot. Look, this is not mold. These veins running through here, eventually what they'll do is they can look like this. This is Serpula lacrimans. This is the organism I told you we can identify by odor. When we walk into a property and we smell it, 
For this particular property, um, th some, this is dangerous because somebody fell through the floor literally on a second floor deck. They stepped out on the deck and they went through the deck. And it's because Serpula lacrimans is dry rot and it, very beautiful fans. These are the mycelial veins you see. These can actually go out even across concrete and rocks as this organism is searching for food. The reason it's called dry rot is because it's going to find wood and now it's going to transport all the water it needs to the dry wood. And sometimes you'll see these veins and they'll actually be weeping or, or sweating because they're transporting moisture into the food source. If you see something like this, this is very, very a grave concern to the property owner because this can result in catastrophic structural failure in under four years. And when I mean catastrophic, in a property we worked at, they had what are called uh, laminated beams, lamb beams, and these were nine inch lamb beams that held up the entire structure. And in two of the buildings out of eight, that lamb beam that held the entire structure up, consider that's what this guy here is. This is a support. Now see that, that uh, iron beam, for this, and that holds everything up. Now for the structure that we were involved,